You're listening to Sermon Cast Media from Antioch Community Church in Wichita, Kansas. For more of our sermons, resources, or to support this ministry financially, see our website at antiochwichita.org. Um, <clears throat> so last week, I uh, stood up here and bawled like a baby for a while and uh, shared, um, many of you hadn't heard uh, my wife and I's story, our testimony of how God had um, captured our hearts and uh, this tumultuous journey. If you didn't get a chance, you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to go back. Uh, all of our stuff you can find on our app or on iTunes or any of the other streamy things that are out there that we're, we're all over the place. And we have tens and tens of followers and listeners. <laughs> <clears throat> really thinking about quitting this job and just going into that full time. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but, um, but I would encourage you to go back and listen to that just so you know our story. Uh, and as you think about it, as I shared our story, I shared a lot of crazy stuff like, uh, you know, addictions and <laughs> living in the whorehouse and affairs that happened in our family, bad parenting. I and mean, we shared a lot of these things. And some people would say, hey, that's embarrassing. I would never do that. And I would say, you know what? It is embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing to stand here and say, hey, here's all the ways that I've screwed up and I've jacked up and the way my wife screwed up and here are all the things that we've done wrong. Uh, I hope I helped you feel better about yourself, right? And some of you have stories that would probably make me feel better about myself. But in the end, the point is, is I will face the embarrassment and push myself down so that the work of Jesus can be magnified. When we share where we've come through and what has happened to us, what we are doing is we are proclaiming that God is better than the situation and Jesus heals. So I would rather sit here and go, there's that jacked up guy with the jacked up family and I think he's got a bit of a weight problem, don't say anything. I would rather stand here like that instead of being fake and sitting up here acting like um, my doo-doo don't stink because there's nobody whose doo-doo don't stink. Amen? Amen. Uh, I mean, plastic preachers and all this stuff, let's just be real. We, we, need, we all need Jesus to come. And so my wife and I, our story is amazing, in the, is, is embarrassing in the flesh, but it is the power of God. I'm only standing here because Jesus is who he is, right? And so I take it seriously, the pastor, and to lead a church of people that are like me, I take that seriously because I know how hard it is, but I also know more importantly than how hard it is. I know how powerful the people of God are who understand suffering, understand restoration, and understand newness in Christ, right? There's this whole paradigm. There's people who deny everything and act like everything's okay, and they're horrible, and they end up doing whatever, having affairs or you know, uh, suicide. All these things happen over here. And then there's another group of people that are super transparent with all their junk, but they don't even want to change. They just like to share how messed up they are. It's like a com competition thing. Oh, you were in uh, treatment for three years? Ha <laughs> ha! Five, yeah. six, seven, yeah. eight, twelve, yeah. right? <laughs> you went to jail. You died how many times? Four, six. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle your story, but it's not bragging rights, right? If you're sit sharing the same story you've shared for 10 years and it's not changing, there's a problem. You're, you're, you're a person of what he did, not what he's doing. And we need to be both. Amen? So we can align ourselves for what he will do. And so <clears throat> we talk about suffering. And we're going to go back. I'm actually going to preach the sermon I didn't get to last week <laughs> with some modified stuff. Um, what you do with the doctrine of suffering will change your entire life. Let me say it again. What you do with the doctrine of suffering will change your entire life. Everyone suffers. Everyone will suffer. Some of you have been like, I've had a really good life. I say, praise God. But I have yet to be on the bedside of somebody that was taking their last breath where they went, Woo! I made it out of this dog without any problems. <laughs> Sorry for you suckers. <coughs> And it's not, it's, people will say, well, that sounds really morbid. Uh, it, it's morbid because sin is morbid. It's not because God isn't good that suffering happens. 
Uh, it's because man was wicked and denied God and rebelled why things are hurt. Cancer comes from the fall, all right? Abuse comes from the fall. Addictions come from the fall. Theft, lying come from the fall. Then people, we want to shake our fist at God, but I got to tell you, the only reason we have an out is because God. He's the only way out. That's the perspective. Well, how can good things happen to, you know, bad things happen to good people? There's no good people. And I don't mean like, you might be very nice. You help widows across the street. You know what I mean? You buy children candy at the store, whatever. You might be a good person, but the problem is sin is sin. Sin is death. Every, you might not murder people. You might not be a drug addict, but your wicked thoughts, your lying, your lusting, they have the same punishment as everybody else. It's all death because God is pure. We are not, we cannot coexist in that real place. That's why we need a savior. That's the gospel. Like Jesus made a way <laughs> for us to be near to God. Amen? So the question is, when it comes to my suffering, will I live as a victim or will I use the suffering that I go through to live a life that glorifies and honors God? Every single one of us have that choice. And some people will say, well, you don't understand what I've been through. And I've been through a lot, but maybe I don't. And I am so sorry. I literally, I said this last week, I'm so sorry for those that abused you and abandoned you. And I'm so sorry for the people that turned their backs on you or what you did to other people that you can't seem to live with. All I know is that there is grace and mercy for what you've done. There is grace and mercy for what has been done to you. And it is the devil's snare to keep you frustrated and broken and angry for the rest of your life. And there are so many people in the church that are shouting, I love you, Jesus, but if we're going to get into your heart, you're really ticked off. And you need to make amends because God not only wants to set you free, there's a big difference between salvation and walking in freedom. Like we've talked about that before. Do you understand? You could be saved and miserable, which shouldn't go together. It really shouldn't. And there's some questions in there. We're not going to get into that debate. But listen, God, if there, he set us free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I don't feel free. Okay, it's not the lack of God. Maybe, are you even in the process to getting freed up to be used by God? And for the rest of us who haven't maybe had a lot of tumultuous stuff that happened in our lives, praise God. I literally thank God for that. But it's coming. And can you get to a place where you prepare your heart to know that when suffering comes, I'm going to hold on to the robe of Jesus by the way, holding on to Jesus doesn't have to be pretty. We see the lady that had been bleeding for 12 years in the scripture, and Jesus is walking through. She doesn't try to get in his face. She just lunges and grabs for a tassel of his robe in faith. That can be you spiritually, and that's okay. Amen? As long as you're going to the source of the one that we touch that can heal us. Amen? Suffering is not what defines us, but it is what will shape us. God uses the broken things to make us strong. One question I've asked myself for a long time is, are you going to waste your suffering? Are you going to waste it? Are you going to waste the things that God has pulled you through on anger, hurt, unforgiveness, pity? Because I'm going to tell you right now, all the things that you think are the worst things in your life, are actually fuel for the most freedom and overcoming and ministry that you can ever pertain to in your life. People who have been sexually abused in this room and in my past, I have seen those people do one of two things, self-destruct or be reconciled by the blood of Jesus and be used in powerful ways. One of my wife's greatest ministries is walking with women who have been sexually abused like she was. She couldn't make that up. She knows. She knows what it is to be betrayed by people who should keep you secure. It's just she would have never gotten there if she would have chose the self-destruction and pity that comes with that life. You have to make a choice between what's happened to me ruling you or letting Jesus rule you, heal you, and use you. 
for the greater good. Amen? So last week, we alluded <laughs> to this verse, and it was the verse that we founded this church on. Uh, it's 1 Peter 5.10. You can open your Bibles. Uh, by the way, 1 Peter is just a great book. Peter talking to the dispersed people of God who are running for their lives and giving them hope in the middle of <clears throat> this desolation and running, fear of death. Uh, I used the <clears throat> NIV version for this, and um, I don't really like the NIV version, but I have to use it for this because it's how we memorized it. Some of the old King James people grew up like that. You're like, oh, thou wast right. Thou wast all right. Amen? You can't help it. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad the Lord sent the elect standard version, the ESV. But uh, we memorized it <coughs> in NIV, and that's the only time you'll ever see me use it. Uh, it's a fine Bible translation. Um, some people get offended by that. How could you say that about my NIV? <laughs> the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself, say himself, himself. restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What a verse. We're going to break that down a little bit today. I just want to just end with a challenge. Um, but as we, we break down the verse, I just want to break it down piece by piece. And the first part of it says, and the God of all grace, see it highlighted there. What is grace? We all know that grace is the unmerited favor of God, right? It's something we can't earn. It's what you get that you shouldn't. Everybody understand what I'm saying? The grace of God is what is, is you getting life, you getting newness, you getting freedom, you getting love when you don't deserve it. That is grace. When you're giving somebody something that doesn't deserve it, but you do it freely on our, uh, our worldly level. But in his level, <laughs> it's pretty expansive. And so grace is the unmarried favor of God. We look just, I just got verses to kind of point to this. I love this verse in Micah uh, chapter 7, 18 through 19. Um, it says, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us and he will tread out our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sin into the depths of the sea. <laughs> Do you hear that? Who is a God like you? Who is it that knows every single minute and second of your life? He knows every sin you have committed, you are committing, and you will commit. And yet his mercy and his grace abound. Who is a God like that? You want to know the difference between, uh, <laughs> besides reality, you want to know the difference between Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and the, the wacky Smith guy in the mountains and the Mormons, all this. And you want to know the difference is all of those are works-based theology. You have to da -da -da, pray to Mecca. You have to da -da -da -da. You have to appease the gods. You have to leave offerings. Da -da -da -da. All of these things. But by Jesus, the only reality, he says, look, you can't. I'm the only one that can. I will lay down my life for you because you would never be able to lay down your life enough to obtain me. That's his grace. <laughs> Amen. And by the way, if you don't wake up every day reminding yourself and preaching the gospel to yourself, you will forget and we will become worldly, and we will walk in the ways of man. Amen? The Scripture is clear. Now, this is it's a hard word, but it's a simple word that could set us free. The Scripture is clear. We talked about this for 15 years. The Bible says I only deserve one thing. The Bible says I only deserve one thing. What is it? Death. The beginning of Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, right? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the amen. Let me give you an amen this morning, even in the brink of world war. <laughs> we are no longer, because of the blood of Jesus, under the weight of our sin. We're free because of the grace of God, amen? And the scripture says, it, it says in a fullness, it says, all grace, and if I can isogeet for a minute and just have some fun, I'm just kidding. And this is the characteristic of God. Listen, all grace, what does it mean by all grace? This is, this, this, let me share my heart with you. If all we deserve was death, then everything else we have is grace. Everything, every breath, 
Every child, every home, every minute, every day, every job, (laughs) every relationship that's godly. You know what I'm saying? If I deserve death only and I've been saved by grace, everything is a gift. Like God's grace is enough. We see that in the words of Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where he's pleading for God to take this thing from his, you know, take this thing from him three times. And the Lord says, "Uh uh-uh. The Lord says to him, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, when he tells Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, it's not just talking about whatever physical ailment or spiritual ailment that Paul was going through. That's an anthem for us. My grace is sufficient for you. I don't have what I want. (laughs) You have the grace of God. I don't have what I think I need. You have the grace of God. I'm not where I want to be, but you have the grace of God, and the grace of God is enough. I think we take the little things for granted sometimes. And the funny thing is, the little grace thing isn't little. Listen, here's a... (laughs) Stephen J. Cole, love this guy, he said this. He says, he is the God of all grace. He's not the God of a little bit of grace. He's not the God of a lot of grace. He's the God of all grace. His grace is like an ocean, a limitless supply that keeps breaking over our lives time and time again. It will never run out. God's grace doesn't stop. It washes over us like a wave. And guess what? That means everything is a gift. You want to talk about how we get free? from the horrors and the shadows and the thoughts of abuse, abandonment, neglect, worry, brokenness, self-insufficiency, it's this. You remember that everything you have is a gift. Yeah, but the thing that happened to me, it doesn't make me feel like life is a gift. I get it. And so does he. That's why you have to do work. That's why you have to get help. That's why you have to get healed. Because the enemy will tell you, look at that. How dare God do that to you? Yet, you still sit here and breathe. You still sit here and love. You still sit here with the love of God, his grace around you. And you still sit here with the opportunity to walk in freedom because of Jesus. Amen? The verse moves on. It says, God of all grace, he said, who called you. Everybody say, who called you. By the way, this is why it takes me like three years to preach through a book of the Bible. (laughs) Not everybody has that sentiment, but I love you. (laughs) Uh, I remember, I don't know if you guys know this, but Piper preached the book of Romans. It took him seven years. That makes me excited. Makes some of you gag. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And here's another and word. What does that mean? I mean, you can get a little out of hand, right? Uh, (coughs) That was a sidebar. I'll take that out. Sorry. Um, But he said, who called you? The God of all grace who called you. And so that happens in a couple ways. If we look in the scriptures in Psalm 139, it's a popular verse, verse 13, for you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I don't think we stop and remember that enough. When we talk about, and some of you see God as this, like this broadcast, big spectrum. God loves me. I'm a part of one of the billion ants. I get it. We're all in God's love. Da, da, da. But listen, there's a specificity to God's love. He loves you so much that he created you. So to be able to call you in the first place, he had to create you. Like God knows every hair on your head. He knows every minute of your life. He knows everywhere you're going to go, everywhere you're not going to go. Like he created you the way you are. Which, by the way, should help with your identity. I suck. God says differently. I'm ugly. God says differently. Oh, I almost did a -a mix-a-lot quote. Never mind. (laughs) And then the scriptures go on. I just want to share some of these verses with you, but not he created you in his calling, but he also chose you for redemption. Here's the thing about the gospels. Not only did God create us in his image, like he knows the colors of your eyes. He knows the cells in your body, but he knows that we broke covenant with him. And then he actually pursued us with the blood of Jesus. And he actually chose you to be redeemed. I love sovereign predestination doctrine in the morning. And if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. For the rest of you that do, yes, sir. Amen? Sorry, I'll take that one out too. But listen, God chose you in your sin for redemption. Nobody comes to the Lord except through Christ Jesus. It's clear. 
which means he has pursued you. We're going to talk about some of these verses. Listen, John 6, 44, no one come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. How did you end up coming to Jesus? Well, I was at church camp and we sang this really great song about Father Abraham. And I knew in that minute when they started doing the right leg, I was in. <clears throat> it's always the right leg. It's always the right leg. But listen, that scripture just said, you came to him because the Father drew you. Don't you think for a minute, like it was happen chance one day you got up and said, oh, I think I need religion. Uh, and you might have said that, but that's inaccurate. When you finally came to Jesus, you only came to Jesus because he chose you and pursued you and opened the door for you. Like the God of all grace who, who called you. Romans 8, 28 through 29 through 30, excuse me. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified also glorified. That's a whole another three-week sermon in itself. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Even as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world. Do, do me a favor, say that. He chose me in him before the foundation of the world. Like you need a self-help book? The God of heaven chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Nobody's a mistake. And nobody doesn't have purpose. <laughs> I'll say this quote. Uh, identity is essential to the power, to powerful suffering in this life. What happens in the middle when the ball drops, the floor drops out on you, and there's suffering, if you do not know who you are, if you do not know that God predestined you, he chose you, he loves you, that he has plans for you, not to forsake you, but to, to give you prosperous life in him. Like he comes, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but he comes to do what? To give abundant life. If you don't know your identity, when the bottom falls out, so will your heart. You have to know who you are. You are the chosen, loved children of God, and he champions for you. So when the bottom falls out, when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you have to remind yourself that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what does it say? He's with me. So you have to go into this mode. When brokenness comes, you have to look around because your flesh and <laughs> the flesh and the world will cry out, whoa, 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 where is he? You're abandoned, you're nothing. By the scriptures, if I know that Jesus is the God of redemption, God is my father, that he loves me, that he has a plan for me, that I can hold on to the tassel of God through the storm and I can walk through and not be decimated. Your identity is critical to how you suffer. <laughs> Scripture moves on and says, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. By the way, it says in Christ. Everybody say in Christ. Can it happen any other way? Uh, what if you like a little Buddha, a little Muhammad on the side? Can you fashion something to where um, you can make this work? Now, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. <laughs> Nothing one comes to the Father except through me. By the way, when we ask people, like, hey, um, it's dangerous. Altar calls can be dangerous sometimes because you're like, hey, if you want God, you know, raise your hand. And stuff. When we're saying, <laughs> hey, do you want to surrender to Jesus in your life? It means, do you understand that he is the only thing that can raise you out, that can change your life, that can give you eternity? It's not a better choice for morality what are you? Well, I'm a kind of Christian mixed with a little bit of, you know, feng shui, hippie. You know, and I feel if I combine those, and it sounds funny, but that's what the church has become. We've allowed spiritualism to run through with our Jesus. This is why we don't want to hold true on hard doctrines when society doesn't want to listen. Jesus said what he said, and we love him and we follow him. And we don't wash what he said, even the hard things, because he's the only way, he's the only truth, he's the only lie. And no one comes to the Father except through him. That means his way. Now, it doesn't mean we're a bunch of Neanderthals and we say, you're stupid sinners. Here's the thing that people forget. The church has tried to hold on to doctrine over the years of Jesus, yet they wouldn't do it Jesus's way. 
right? The doctrine of God is solid. The presentation like godly men and women also has to be solid. You can't condemn people to hell. The Bible says, <laughs> and, uh, and do it that way without the blood and the love of Jesus on this side, right? We're not the convictors of men. The word is. The spirit of God is, right? Oh boy. Sorry, I tangented, tangented, I tangented. That's not going to work. Okay. And it says, calls you to his eternal glory. What does that mean? What is God's glory? God's glory is almost impossible to define. Can I just tell you, the glory of God is, you can't, there's no way I can say, Zip, and you'd be like, oh, nailed it, right? So here's my attempt. <coughs> it's his power and his radiance and love. It's his personality. It's his movements. It's, it's sometimes uh, I read this, like it's stated that God's glory is the external manifestation of his being. Everything he is inside, good and gracious and justice and pure, um, his glory is what stems out of that. It's the personification of that. And so the scripture says we are in his eternal glory. Piper said the glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. It is the going public of his holiness. And so as we look to the scriptures, that's a forever thing. And it starts right now. Like you're in God's eternal glory. That's what the grace thing is so important, right? We're walking in grace. We have the glory of God. It's eternal. Tell me, when does eternal stop? Huh? I've got to be like Francis Chan and bring out that rope that doesn't end and has a little thing on. Everybody know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not usually that creative. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> you just see all this pointing to it. It starts now, but like 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him, excuse me, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Here's what eternal glory means. We have forever freedom, we have forever righteousness, forever joy, forever in his presence, forever peace, forever love, forever fullness. Eternal glory living starts now. And then we got the good stuff and then it, then it turns a little bit on us. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory through Christ after you have suffered a little while. Note the progression. What is the progression between <laughs> glory and suffering. What had to come first, the cross or, or, or the resurrection? Right? Like what, what had to come first? If, if we look at this, um, Peter is saying that believers are going to have to live with the understanding that God's purpose realized in the future requires pain now. That's what happened with the fall. Like we suffer, but thankfully because of Christ Jesus, our suffering is not in vain. And by the way, we're going to talk about this in a minute. The suffering is actually to our advantage. Suffering is a blessing to us, usually in hindsight. You're right. No, no, nobody wakes up that morning like a moron. All right, God, punch me. Take one of my children and make me lose my job. I'm ready to grow spiritually. <laughs> and if you do... You either need some meds or, or you're far more spiritual than the rest of us, and we should probably learn from you. Uh, but, but by the way, think about it, though, for a minute. I, I say this, but I think the Spirit of God is telling me this. Remi 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 reminder, there's a Ukrainian church that rose this morning. There's a Ukrainian church that rose this morning and said, I don't care what they do. We're going to stay, we're going to fight, we're going to pray, and we're going to be Jesus, even if it costs my life. Where does that come from? That does not come from prosperity gospel preaching. That does not come, I'm not trying to be that guy, but we have, this is a part of my journey to end the spiritual pansification of the church. It sounds horrible, but God's people are gangsters. God's people are spiritual thugs. I'm serious. When we learn suffering and how to be built through suffering, right? Like he doesn't scare us anymore. Right? We, don't, we don't allow things that happen in our lives. They might take our breath, but they're not going to take my purpose. They're not going to take my identity. I can stand strong in Jesus. Y'all, that will preach. That's all I'm saying. 
Your doctrine of suffering is going to change your life. So the scriptures just said, after you've suffered a little while, here's the deal. 1 Peter 5, it's great to read 1 Peter 5.10, but you don't understand 1 Peter 5.10 until you go back and read. It's almost like you need to read all the Bible to understand it, right? <laughs> it's almost like context is important, always, right? It's all, context is always important. That's why when you look at coffee mug verses, please go back and read the totality of what's going on there. Well, you know, Ray Lewis is like, the Lord says no weapon formed against me shall prosper in football. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just bagged on Ray Lewis. God bless that guy. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Sorry, Jesus. But here's the verses that came before 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. What does it say? Be watchful. Our enemy, the devil, he is prowling. He's prowling in this room. He's been prowling in this country over the last however many years. He was prowling in the South. He was prowling overseas. He's prowling in Ukraine, looking for people to devour. And the scripture says, hey, <laughs> resist him. And then it goes immediately into the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory through Christ Jesus after you have suffered a little while. Listen, more proof. Suffering's coming. We have an enemy. By the way, if, you don't, if your doctrine of, of um, spiritual warfare is weak, your understanding of this is going to be weak. 24-7, there is an enemy prowling over your children, over our city, over my life. He's whispering in my ear. <laughs> he's on the TV. He's on the news. He is looking to devour you. That's, not like, that's why like a no hell theology is just horrible. It's stupid and wicked. There's a real enemy. There's a real eternal destination outside of the destination of God's people. And there's an enemy who hates you, wants to kill you, and would love for you to get just comfortable enough to avoid the glory and power. The one who will whisper in your ear and tell you, man, God doesn't love you. You lost that baby. If God was good, God wouldn't hold you to lose that baby. If God was good, he would have stopped your spouse from cheating. He would have, if God was good, he would have let a dad be in the home to take care of you. Spitting lies. Watch out. Because none of those things are true about the God who saves us. Amen? <clears throat> goodness of God is not just quote, the goodness of God has not only seen when things are well, the goodness of God who resides directly in the middle, that the goodness of God also resides directly in the middle of suffering. I think about my kids. You know, I started talking about this last week, but I got my little girl. She's nine. She's the baby. And I know, like, I don't, I'm like super over predictive dad. Ask my kids, especially my daughter. I'm like super over predictive dad because and this has happened with all my kids, but I look into their face and they're so sweet and they're so innocent. They can be a little knuckleheady. They take after their dad, not their mom. But I know things are coming that are going to crush her spirit. People are going to say nasty things. People are going to want to abuse her. People are going to want to take advantage of her. And it's my heart's desire to protect her and to protect all of my kids from that. The, and the problem is, A, you can't protect your kids from all of that. You need to try. You need to step in the gap. But here's something, mom and dads, that's way more important. Teach them how to persevere. Teach them how to say yes to God in the middle of adversity. You can't spare their suffering. We could try to spare some with paying stupid tax and throwing it out there, right? Like, listen to me, child, that's dumb. Uh-uh. Ten years later, yeah, that was dumb, dad. Sorry. <laughs> right? I mean, I love those conversations. Not that I've ever had any. I've had some. <clears throat> but the thing is, we have to teach our kids this. If your kids see you completely wiped out when bad things happen, they will learn those rhythms in their lives. We need to teach them that grab their hands. Don't hide it. If you're suffering, if there's a problem going on in your marriage, whatever it is, grab the hands of your children and say, listen, the devil is trying to devour our home, but let's pray. 
Let's see what Jesus has for us and let's follow him through this hard season. People teaching their kids that if they do right, they won't suffer is horrible. You overprotecting your children, all of us through the ages is actually to the detriment of our children. Not sharing your own struggles. You want to talk about a great day? <laughs> the day Jen and I sat down and shared with our older four kids all the things they never knew about our marriage and about our life. You know what, though? <laughs> it's embarrassing. I didn't want my kids to battle thinking those thoughts about me or my wife, but it is the glory and the testimony of God that Jen, Dan's, and I will not back down. We will trust God. We will suffer, but we will not be knocked down by it. We will stand on the blood of Jesus. We're not going anywhere. I'm not going to flip off the end of the world someday and abandon you as a shepherd or as a pastor. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. You're not going to find me laying out on the news, and I know I need to be careful, but I understand that my no to those things is your hope. And my yes to the things of God is our good. I don't want to cause that pain on you. I'm a human. Don't expect me to be perfect, but I want you to know that I'm somebody who will stand here with you, stand on the blood of Jesus, stand on the rock, and no matter if our faces get kicked in or not, we won't back down. People get annoyed at me when I show up to their house sometimes when they're going through something. I'm very compassionate at first. Then after a little while, I'm like, hey, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says like we are, we are overcomers. Like we don't have to stay this. Uh, people who are 20 years into the sorrow and grief of their stuff without any restitution, it's sad. That's not his heart for you. Somebody needs to speak boldly. And here's the problem. People go to a church where people speak boldly and want to help them walk out of their stuff, their discipleship and stuff. Most people leave. Most people leave when nobody gets healed. You just go to another church and play church. When there's people here that want to help you get out of <laughs> your crap, honestly. Amen? A few things about suffering. <clears throat> it's around the corner. Suffering identifies us with Jesus. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14 Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was happening. So just think about it. Oh, hey, where did that come from, right? Like you can't be surprised that the enemy's trying to chew on us. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Quite honestly, Romans 5, 3 through 5, um, I would not be, and I don't proclaim to be anything awesome, but I would not be who I am in Jesus and where I am if it wasn't for suffering. I'm too much of a knucklehead. I always have to learn things the hard way, mostly as I was younger. I'm trying to avoid that now because my head hurts, right? I won't learn it any other way. Like for some reason, that's humanity. Our ways, oh, God's ways are above ours and ours could be wicked. Oh, that's great. I've got it. I've got this. Oh, we're going to do this my way. We're going to deal with money this way. We're going to deal with it. I've got it. And it says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. If we never have to suffer, how do we know how to endure? If we never had to suffer, how would we ever get a truly godly character if the character of Christ was birthed through suffering? Why would we expect to follow a God who went through deep suffering and when he said, hey, they hate you, hate me, they're going to hate you, why would we think we would have anything different? That's why when we live in a quote-unquote Christian society, we should be nervous. If we never had to suffer, would we have hope? Tell me you learned real hope in good times. Or you learned what hope was because in the middle of the night, you were so busted, broken, lonely, and hopeless that you only had one place to reach and the God of heaven again, pulled you out. You want to know why I have hope for Ukraine? Because <laughs> I've seen God do it. You want to know why I have hope for my kids? Because I've seen God do it over and over again. He has always done it. 
and he always will. It's a jerky quote. We need to allow him to move our suffering from pity to power. 1 Peter 1, 7 says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it, it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Bob Diefenbaugh says, The very trials which may appear to be the means Satan employs for our destruction are the means God employs for our deliverance and development. Behind the opposition of unbelievers stands Satan seeking to devour us, but come on! And behind Satan stands God, sure to perfect and purify us. Our daddy will literally kick the crap out of their daddy. Quote that bad dog in the book someday. <clears throat> I got the smile from Jen. I'll stop. <clears throat> Let me ask you just a question. Um, is it possible that a group of people like us who know how to suffer, who, and I, I know there's a new room, this different one, every single person in here was highly medicated and, and you know, smoking crack before they came into church, which now it's probably only about half of you, praise God. <clears throat> Some of you still need more medication. Uh, is it possible that a people like us, small church, Wichita, Kansas, don't have thousands of dollars and big ministry, this and that. Is it, is it possible that if we actually read the scripture for what it is and know how to come through brokenness, that we're actually more blessed with the opportunity of the expansion of the gospel? Like you want to know who has a heart that cries for mamas in our city that are lonely and on the other side of the earth, mamas who know that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life. Who else wants to go set free addicts all over the place and all over the world than people who know how to come out of it? Who, who knows how to go rescue fatherless boys and girls besides the ones who have been redeemed because of the father stepped in and became their daddy? Who else? Maybe we've been lied to the whole time. Maybe we're not just some insignificant little church on the corner. Maybe we are actually the powerhouse and opportunity for kingdom growth in this city, this city by, the, by the living God. Like, I believe that. I believe that in you, and I believe that in me. We just have to do, we, here, let, me, let me say this. We are a weird place, amen? Some of you are like, you have no idea. <laughs> but listen, we are a church that comes from broken places, but... We have a heart for discipleship, heart for worship, heart for missions, heart to see people set free. And here's the thing with that. We believe in that, but I need pioneers. We don't have 2,000 people, young adults. What's the biggest problem with young adults in ministry? They're very transient. And if they don't go somewhere where there's a big group of them, they usually don't plug in. How do we ever become that group of people with the right heart, with the missions heart that are full of the Holy Spirit, that worship and go to the nations if we don't have young adults to step up and say, me, I'll be a pioneer for that generation. Mom and dads to come in and say, you know what, I have a busy schedule, but discipleship is more important. Being with the church is more important and we will sacrifice. I will stand in the gap. Addicts who actually want to get free and stand in the gap. Addicts who want to go to the nations. We need pioneers. And that's hard because if we had a whole lot more people, by the way, having a whole lot more people has its own problems. But we want to grow, but we need men and women that will say, you know what, it's not pretty, it's nasty. Rob talks a lot, says stupid things sometimes. <laughs> Man, I want to be a pioneer. We are a unique entity in this city. I'm telling you, it is the favor of God that we're here. We just have to buy it. We got to believe what he says and to be all in and not do church the old way, but do it the ancient way. See what I did there? <clears throat> I believe that about you. Jesus says this to Peter in Matthew 16, it's in our lineage. And I tell you, Peter, that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You are his church. And when we live and grow and act like the church, the gates of hell do not prevail against us. Amen? Rounding the corner, <laughs> to suffer a little while. What does the word, let's go deep Greek. What does the deep meaning of a little while mean? 
It means a little while. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say a little while. The Greek, the Greek literally means puny in extent. Everybody say puny. puny. Now, does suffering seem puny to us? No, it seems like it's a big deal, right? Our entire life we, we might be going through, but, but listen, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Amen. My inner self, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. One thousand forty-two and a half, Sadie, years from now. I'm serious. Take your brain, 1,042 and a year, half years from now. Do me a favor. Whatever you're doing, you're out sun tanning, hanging with Paul, having deep theological discussions. Stop for a minute and look back on the things that you've gone through for a few years, 20 years. What if it's 50 years? What does it look like compared to the eternity that you have? Puny. You have to remind yourself that we are eternal beings. Some people might suffer their entire 70 years, whatever. Honestly, most of us, we've suffered three or four years here, three or four years here, all of that. Even though the devil would make us think it's all of our lives, it is puny in extent. It's one of my favorite sermons to myself. 1,042 and a half years from now, Rob, what will I think of this situation? Amen? And don't you steal that because it's not going to be in my book. <laughs> and by the way, the scriptures say there's an end to the suffering. It ends. Right? When we read places like Revelation 21.4, what does it say? He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. And a form of things have passed away. Can you imagine? This is what I love about heaven. Seeing Jesus. And I've said this before. I get old. I only have like three pastor references. I say I've got 20 years in. Okay. But uh, when I see Jesus, I'm going to have him and have no more of me. I'm excited to be in heaven because I want to be with him, which means when I'm with him, I'm not in the presence of my dying, fleshly, nasty junk. It will be over. Do you understand there's a day coming where you will never cry again? You will look to the things that rip your heart out now and you won't even be able to retract those memories that will cause pain. We will be in the glory of Christ, Jesus. And it will be over. Amen? The end of the text, just because I know you have to go beat Methodist people to lunch, says he himself will restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. The word restore in the Greek is literally this word where a bone, this, the picture is a bone is broken, and then when it's put back together and mended, what happens? It becomes stronger. That's the word. Like what the Lord's saying, he himself will restore you. He will actually put you back together in a place where you were stronger than you were before, make you strong, firm, steadfast. We don't have to go super deep and all to the, to the ice Jesus, exegesis of all of that, putting stuff in, taking stuff out. It makes you stronger. It makes you stronger. Look at your neighbor and say stronger. Here on earth and for eternity. Here's the deal God always restores. Hmm? Jesus always restores everything. And people will say, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like there's, there's truth to the prosperity gospel, right? The truth is, does God always richly reward? Does he or not? Yeah. Does he, you always get all of that this side of heaven or the other side of heaven? You don't get to dictate that. Does God always heal? Yes, but do we get to dictate what side of heaven that's on, right? Lots of faithful men and women have died praying full of faith. When are they healed now? Yeah, guess what? God always restores. We might not get to dictate what side of heaven, but he always restores. Every broken thing in you, because you belong to the God of heaven, is being restored and will be eternally restored. It's just a little while.
I, I say this. We have a lot of us in this room. I, I think I think I think God highlighted like our some of our teenage boys. Like, <laughs> there's this choice. Um, we have to make a choice in your restoration. You can look at the broken things in your life and say, okay, God, what did you do and what will you do through it? Or I'm going to hold on to this and I'm going to let it bury me. That's literally what it comes down to. And I think a lot about people in this room. I start to think a lot about our, our young boys. And I start to think about how many boys we have that are like caught in fatherlessness. And they don't have daddies and they don't have, and they act out and they act like knuckleheads because they're so broken. And here's my one conversation I have with them. Listen, I know personally how hard this is and how broken and abandoned you feel. But guess what? You, as a 14-year-old, 16-year-old, 18-year-old, you have to make a choice between keeping what your lack of father has done to you and bringing destruction and brokenness on generations of your families and using that, or you need to hold on to Jesus. Hold on to him. Hold on to him and don't allow the suffering to knock you off but to see for what it is that you have a heavenly father and you can't have a life. Broken boys without daddies can have a new life. They can become papas. They can become pastors. Daughters can become fulfilled in what fathers robbed from them. And that pertains to every other area of your life. Did your spouse cheat? Did they leave you? Did they abandon you? You fill in the gap. Jesus says, hey, these all things for the good of those who love me who are called by my name. If it's not being healed, does it mean that you're not letting him have it? Because he wants it. We could be free. I have this weekly challenge. I'm going to throw up here. I'm not going to throw up here. I'm going to throw it up there. <clears throat> and I want you to know, I'll send it out on all of our social media and stuff. But listen, how do I view the suffering I have been through in my life? Is my view kingdom clear? What do I mean by like that? Whatever it is, do I see how Jesus was working? Do I need someone to help me see how Jesus was in the middle of that? <clears throat> Looking back, how has God restored you from suffering in the broken places? Some of you know how to answer that. Some of you have never sat down and actually looked how Jesus maneuvered and, and mastered your way through. You need to see how Jesus worked. Like for us, we lost a baby, broke my heart. God used it to bring us to faith. We went through a nasty affair in our life. Event, life-changing, should have been done. God used it to bring new life and mercy. You're sitting here today because of it. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you looked over your life and said, man, there's all these hurtful things, but have I gone back and taken inventory of how God brought me through every single one? And if the answer is no, find somebody to help you. Number two, looking at the present. What is God doing now in the broken places through your suffering? Engage yourself. Am I holding on to the tassel of Jesus or am I panicking? Am I frolicking? Am I not looking at Jesus and I'm looking down in the water like Peter and I'm starting to sink because you need to put your eyes back up? Last but not least, <clears throat> looking to the future, how can you prepare your heart to suffer, suffer well in the coming seasons? That sounds so sadistic and awkward, right? Y'all ready to suffer? Yes, pastor. <laughs> but listen, there are things you can do to prepare your heart. Hold on to him now. Put verses in your heart and in your mind and on paper that actually walk through the sufferings. Because I know people that were going through the hell of night with the enemy and walking with your God, and all they had were verses that they kept saying to themselves over and over and over again, but they were prepared. That's not weakness. That's what a warrior does. What does a warrior do when they go into battle? Run in. Hey, here I am. No, real warriors show up with tools and weapons. Protection, right? I'd love for you to do that this week with your spouse, with your friends, house churches, discipleship. Um, if we can answer these things and get kingdom clear on suffering, um, we are gangster. <laughs>